Hallelujah, hallelujah. How many of you are excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? How many of you can attest that you can sing of God's mercies for the rest of your life, amen? How many of you can say that I can sing wherever I go because his praise will forever be on my lips. It's endless, amen? How many of you can say that all your life God has been good, amen? Hallelujah. I could sing of his love forever, amen? Oh, all my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. Sing all my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I will sing wherever I go. Yes, God, he's for me. He's not against me. Yes, I will hold to the plans he has for me. Oh, when I'm broken, hallelujah. Yes, he will fix me. I will call on the name of the Lord. Come on, let's sing it out. And all my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I will see where my heart song in my sorrow he's my hope he's my strength for tomorrow when the storms rise all around me come on I will call on the name of my Lord all my life all I know God's been good good to my soul mountain high Come on, declare this. Not against me. I will hold to those plans he has for me. Yes, when I'm broken, he will fix me. I'll just call. a hand clap of praise this morning live place Hallelujah. it's good to see you all here this morning I'm excited to see what the Lord's going to do today I come expectant today hallelujah sing wherever I go life place church exists to see people in the central valley transformed 
into loving, joyful, spirit-filled followers of Christ. That's why we exist. We don't say it often enough, but we, we exist to connect. We exist to grow. We exist to serve and to go. It connect, grow, serve, and go. Life Place Church. One person said, Samantha preached one time, and this is, this is a place where people will come it's to get uh, healed. It's a trauma center. Life Place Church is a trauma center. If you're new to Life Place Church this morning, take a couple of minutes, if you would, and in the seat backs in front of you, there's a little red uh, connect card. Uh, and we'd like you to fill that out if you could. And, and Pastor would love to get a hold of you just to come alongside of you, uh, not to pester you or, or anything like that, but he'd love to come alongside of you and see, see what he can do to help you in your walk. Amen. Uh, so we've got some general announces, announcements this week. Uh, midweek lift is Callista this week, Wednesday night. Yes, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I'm, I'm thrilled to see what God is doing with our youth at Life Place Church. And uh, her, her being 19 year, 18, 19 years old and speaking, powerful. And then she also has a, uh, a young adult Bible study every Tuesday right here uh, from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. So come out to that youth, come out to the, to the study that she's doing. And it's, uh, I believe she's doing the Purple Book study. So young adult Bible study here at the church from uh, every Tuesday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. We're gonna have another fundraiser for our upcoming tent revival. Tickets go on sale today, yes. Tickets go on sale today and uh, it's gonna be an enchilada dinner. You get three enchiladas, rice and beans, for $10. Church, you're gonna, you're gonna eat somewhere after church on that Sunday. Back into the kingdom so we can look forward to our tent revival this March, amen? I'm gonna have to pre-order. I wish I would've got in on the last one, but we were on vacation when they started selling tickets. So uh, I definitely wanna make sure we get in on this one. We'll, we're gonna eat somewhere after church. We might as well t eat this, amen? If all of us would do that, we could, uh, we could really benefit from, from these fundraisers. And when, when it comes time to do our tent revival, we won't be stressing. We won't be stressing it. Paul said to the churches, take up an offering so when I get here, you won't have to do it, right? Basically, ad-libbing, but that's what he said. And I think we should do that. You know, we should, we should look forward. Hey, plans could change. We don't know what tomorrow brings. God does. But we should make plans as long as it's for the kingdom, for the advancement of the kingdom. Amen. So that tent revival, tickets go on sale today. See Bob Ornalis. Uh, and then Lisa Daggs and her husband, evangelist Ronnie Horton, are with us this morning. Give them a hand clap. I've had church Wednesday night, I had Ironworks Thursday night, we had our, our Christmas dinner Friday night. Last night we had a one night uh, revival. And I'm telling you, it was very powerful. It was powerful, even it was intimate, but it was very powerful. And uh, nobody left here the same way, I'll guarantee you, because when I was driving here, I was yelling at everybody to get out of my way <laughs> on the freeway, and when I went home, it was a little bit more tranquil, <laughs> amen. Let's pray over this worship team this morning in our praise and worship. Father, Lord, I just pray that you'll have your way in today's uh, worship, Father. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing at Life Place Church, Lord. We thank you that hearts and lives are being transformed, Father. Lord, I, I pray a blessing over this uh, worship time, and I give Jesus all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. If you'll stand with me as we go into worship. How many of you know there's nothing better than knowing our Lord? Amen. You know, I've been blessed to be able to be here on Friday and Saturday, listening to Lisa and Ronnie give their testimonies. And I can tell you, if they do it today, they're gonna tell you that there's nothing better. That you can search this world, you can search this world, church, and nothing will satisfy, amen? There's nothing better than knowing our Lord.
cross today. He wants to bind up the brokenhearted. He wants to mend what's been torn. He wants to strengthen and comfort and heal and deliver and save. Come on, let's get involved in this this morning. Let's, let's press in like the woman with the issue of blood. Come on, let's press in and touch the hem of his garment today. We need you, God. We need you. This country needs you, but we need you right here today in Merced, California.
lives in us, lives in us. Now let's personalize it. He lives in me. Therefore, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, high five somebody next to you and say, The Spirit of God is in this house. Hallelujah. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. same power we are uh, wherever we go the Holy Spirit goes we're containers we are containers the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives within us yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. this morning I want to talk a little bit about three levels of giving three levels of giving this morning and uh, I want to remind you also that this is the first Sunday of the month and at Life Place Church, the first Sunday of the month, we put faith into action. And it kind of rhymes with Give a Jackson. So let me tell you something. Give a Jackson. Put, put faith into action. Give a Jackson. A church that sows into missions is a church that's alive. It's a church that's thriving. And if we continue to sow into missions, I believe, I believe that's part of the reason why God has blessed us so much. God has blessed us with extravagant givers. I don't know who they are. I don't even need to know who they are. But every time there's been a demand, God has sent it. It comes from the north, south, east, or west, but it comes. Hallelujah. I want to talk about three levels of giving this morning. And for some, it might be a leap of faith to even think about tithing. I know that about 66% of our church tithes. Most churches. That's awesome. That's awesome, but... It might be a leap of faith for you to think about tithing regularly. And a tithe is 10% of what God gives you. It's 10%. Some of us might be faithful in returning tithes. I call it returning tithes rather than paying tithes. Because when you have to pay something, it's like paying a bill. And we don't necessarily have to pay our bills cheerfully, but God says give cheerfully. God says to give cheerfully, so I call it returning tithes. Amen. And uh, some of us are faithful in it. Some of you might be extravagant givers. That third level of extravagant giving. Every time there's a need, you give. Or every time there's, there's an there's a announcement, you give. And I know that uh, you can't outgive God. You cannot outgive Him. God's a debtor to no one. We all know Malachi 3.10 says, Malachi 3.10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open a window of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to, to receive it. And we stop there. Sometimes we just stop there. I always tell my daughter, I, I say, the only commandment in the Bible with a promise is to honor your parents, that you might live long <laughs> upon this land, right? But there are many, there's many commands in the Bible. And if we look at it like that, Malachi 3.10 is a command. It says to bring it in. And then we stop. But Malachi 3.11 says, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits on your ground. Neither shall the vine cast their fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. So we have a command. Bring ye the tithes into my storehouse. And church, the storehouse is where you're being fed. If you belong to Life Place Church, the storehouse is where you return your tithes. You don't pick another ministry later on to give it to. If you're being fed at Life Place Church, you give your tithes to Life Place Church. Amen. So we have a command and we have a promise. The promise is he's going to rebuke the devourer. Another one with a command is 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and 8. It says, Every man, according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, 
for God loveth a cheerful giver. That's the command. The promise is, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. You follow the command, he fulfills the promise. Amen. Hallelujah. At Life Place Church, we make it easy for you to give. You can go online at lifeplacechurch.com, click on the give icon, and when you're given above and beyond your tithes, you can choose another ministry that you want to sow into. We have a ministry for the evangelist. We have multiple ministries, but this is Mission Sunday. We'd like for you to give a Jackson. I think God's going to bless you for it. Amen. Or you can go through the Church Center app. If you don't have the Church Center app, just download it. 2740 North Highway 59, Life Place Church. And you can give in 10 seconds, just like that. Brother, last night you talked about first fruits. And I believe God honors your first fruits. I love the Church Center app because as soon as I get paid, I don't have church on Friday, but I could return my tithes on Friday. Before I pay any of my bills, before I do anything that I want to do, I can return my tithes. And I believe God honors first fruits. Amen. The third way to give is through the little white envelope in the seat back in front of you. You can still give first fruits because as soon as you get paid, you write the check, you put it in an envelope. And it's set aside, it's set apart. Amen. And then, as I mentioned earlier, if you fill out a Connect card, and just place that in the offering plate as it comes by this morning. We're going to pray over the offering. Father, we thank you for your provision in our lives, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the financial uh, wherewithal that you are providing everybody uh, to be a blessing, Lord. That you are uh, giving us all things so we could be a blessing in all circumstances, Father. You gave us the, the ability to create wealth, Father. And as we prepare to return back to you this morning, Father. I just pray that you would bless each giver, Father. Multiply this gift, Father, for your glory and for your honor, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hallelujah. An old saint said, we're having church up in here. Glory to God. Amen. I love to enjoy the presence of the Lord. You're never more free. You're never more filled with just peace and joy and contentment. Isn't that what the Bible says? There's joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. Come on. There's nothing else like it. I have been in formal kind of religious churches, and folks, there is nothing like the fire. There's nothing like the fire. Once you have sat at the fire, you settle for nothing else. You can't hardly stand it. You just got to go where the fire is. How many know fire attracts people? Amen. People will follow a fire truck to see where the fire is, but they don't follow an ice truck. Come on. Amen. They don't follow one. I love the fire. And you know, on a morning like this where you have guest speakers and so on, where sometimes we're prone to kind of throttle it back and kind of, you know, play it cool, you know. If you'd have done that, these folks would have been disappointed. Because they, they're in a church that has fire, and they're used to fire. And they want you to not be put off by their presence. They want you to enter in and seek God and touch him more than you ever have in your lives. And that's why they're here. They're not here to entertain. They're not here to show off their fancy clothes, which they have fancy clothes, and they're classy people, and they're, they're choice people. The spirit of excellence is on them, but they're not here for that. Amen. They're here to minister to you. And we are just so delighted to have Ronnie and Lisa with us today, all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. It's been an amazing weekend. It's been phenomenal. It's been off the hook. They... They sang for us at our Christmas banquet and ministered in song and, and exhortation. And then last night sang some more. Ronnie preached a powerful, powerful message on two gardens. Sorry, we didn't have it live stream. We didn't have all of our technical people here. But uh, it was a great word. And um, next time he preaches it, just fly out and listen to it, okay, wherever it's at. Uh, it's a great word. And then he's, they're going to be preaching and singing this morning. We're going to turn the service over to them and just a second, but I just want to remind you that at the end of the service, we're going to be receiving a miracle offering for them, and it's going to be powerful. It is going to be extraordinary because you are in the season of giving. Everything God does involves giving. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. God gave his best. And so it's just in our nature, since we're, we're created in his image and his likeness, it's in our nature to give. If you are stingy, that's not godly. Come on. God is extravagant. The Bible said he loads us daily with his benefits. Our cup runs over. I mean, folks, we are blessed, but we're blessed to be a blessing. And I want you to be thinking about the value of the ministry of Ronnie and Lisa and what you're sowing into at the end of this service. You're sowing into top shelf, top notch, anointed ministry, both in preaching and singing. And we want to have people like these not having to go back into the secular workforce because they are not being supported. We want to make sure that they are full-time, come on, that they're on the road, that they're bringing this word and this anointing to churches all over the country. But obviously because of COVID, that has put quite the squelch on traveling ministers and singers. And so you know what? Because that created a time of leanness, we're going to come against lack and leanness, and we're going to give extravagantly so that we can tell the devil, you're not shutting down God's work. You're not going to impede God's work. We are going to see to it that we fund, we don't care what's happening with inflation and the economy, what's happening in the White House. I, I need to take care of my house, and my house says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. 
And so I, I just want to encourage you. A lot of times people, uh, Ronnie, you know this as well as anybody, they kind of come to a service and they say, well, when there's a guest speaker, I always give a certain amount. Don't get stuck in that rut. Be open to the possibility that the Holy Spirit could explode inside of you and say, I want you to do something you've never done before. Come on, somebody. Allow the Lord to challenge you. And when you see the quality of their ministry, you're not going to have any problem sewing into it. Amen? Let's make them welcome. Come on, Ronnie, Lisa, come on up. Have your liberty today. We love y'all. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. And to those of you who have been here, all three services, thank you. Whoa, how do you like that? What am I going to do with this? <laughs> Saying, <laughs> I could do it. Yeah, kind of doing his little thing like that. <laughs> How y'all doing? Good. We are grateful to be here and so blessed that we've been able to, um, no, nah, I don't need it. Thank you. Um, to be able to minister, hopefully, to you, with you, love on you, share our heartache and our, our troubled past and how Christ was always faithful. For those of you, who, how many is it, this is the first time that we've met? Raise your hand. Okay, I need to let you know that I, um, I've been clean and sober for 32 years. I was facing three to five in prison, and I told the Lord if he got me out of the mess I was in, I would never quit telling people. So I needed to let you know that there is hope. I had $1,000 a day rock cocaine habit, and I was raised in the church. But um, God is good. We're here to have some joy put back in our life. We wanted to bring you joy. We wanted to bring you hope. And God did a mighty work last night, intimate, mighty work. So let's do a little Christmas. What do you want? What do you want to do? Okay. Okay, baby. I, my own. I can't hear me. Can you turn me up a little? There, there I go. Okay. God bless you. I am glad you were here too. And, um, I happen to know this, that some of the best people in the world are at Life Place Church on Sunday morning. <laughs> and, I, and I'm glad that you're here. I'm so thankful to those of you who came out and, and enjoyed the banquet on Friday night and the sermon last night. The, the, and, and I tell you, I've already felt the Spirit of God move, and I thought when the pastor got up here just to talk about the offering that we could have gone home today and say we've been in church. We saw people in the altars. We felt the Spirit of God move. Yes. And I'm glad that we're in a church where you can feel the Spirit of God move and nobody gets scared about it. They might get excited, but we've unfortunately been in some churches. We sing in a lot of non-denominational churches, and that just means they don't know what they are. And non-denominational churches that you go in, and if you ever felt the wind of the Spirit move, they would look for a draft somewhere. They think there must be a door open. They just aren't familiar with it. I'm glad to be in a place where God can move right. and nobody's scared about it. We may get excited about it, but that's what we're supposed to do. When the Spirit shows up, we're supposed to enter in and let him do his work in our life. So we are glad and privileged to be here this morning. We are. I love that last song. It reminded me of the 60s music. You know, it was very cool. <laughs> it was cool. It was all cool. Hey, Lindsay. You rock, baby. <laughs> We're grateful for you. Okay, let's sing. Come on. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive, receive her.
Augusto, El Mi Corazon. <laughs> El Mi Corazon, don't they? El Mi Corazon, right? <laughs> Cristo es el fortaleza de mi vida. See, si. we're going to have a blast from the past. We may need a little more umph on this because this is recorded. Do you hear me, Ike? Talking to you, Ike. <laughs> Here we go. from the past. Woo! Woo! That's the kind of stuff you like, huh? Maybe we got, no, well, maybe we got another one for him. Fast country one? Huh? Did we do that one already? Yes. Yes. Do you know my music? It, like, okay, what country fast song do you like off of it? What's your favorite? Now you put them on the spot. Hmm. You don't know that well, do you? We've got product back there. <laughs> Buy all those Christmas CDs. There's one time a year I get to sell them, put them in stockings. Um, there's a message in it. It starts off very fun, 40s, and then it ends with a message. So um, take, take all you want and leave the rest. And um, yeah. Don't take all you want, but buy all you want. Take all you want. We're not into that gang looting like you've been having out here in California, so. Did I sing this one last night? No, we didn't. Okay, we're going to do another one. You know this one. Here we go. Okay, yeah, I do need it, Julie. Come on. Well, I met up with 
this friend I used to know He said you don't hang around those places you used to go You used to drink and dance and carry on And you love just getting high from dusk till dawn He said the fun of life is passing by ha, But I stood there for a minute Then I gave him this reply I'm still dancing But it's not the same I'm still drinking much when i gave my heart and life back to the lord where y'all January... been anyway wait hang on where have you been the last two nights right when i gave my heart back to Thank the lord you, january brother. 11th i thought i would had spent all my fun and i wasn't going to have any fun as a christian and i was doomed to live this boring christian life that my mom so desperately prayed for i was so wrong again <laughs> ronnie you got a beautiful voice my husband. Thank you, dear. You're a pretty good preacher, too, mister. Oh, thank you, dear. Not pretty good. You're my favorite. Ah, you're my favorite, too. Well, it's a good thing I got married. We didn't plan this, y'all. We just do this. <laughs> so this is a song that um, the Henson family, how many, how many of you here know the Hensons? Around from this area down in here, not too far. And this was a hit for them back in the day. When I did my album of, a couple years ago, I just needed to put a couple of Henson songs on it because they influenced my life so much. Pastor and I were talking a little bit about it. Kenny Henson, in my mind, was one of the greatest country gospel singers and one of the greatest singers of all times, really. He could do it so easily, and you could feel it. He was a great preacher, too. And I had the privilege of when I was younger, we sang in the same churches that they did. So we sang with them often, and uh, so I grew up. My One of my greatest memories is... We were singing at a church one night, and Kenny Henson, they were loading in their bus, and we were loading in our trailer, if you know what I mean. I mean, it was kind of like we I'm had an still equipment loading trailer. In the trailer. Um, but Kenny came over to me, and he said, keep it up, son, and, or keep it up, son, and one of these days you're going to be something. Well, you know, we all need encouragement, but the main thing is that my Father in heaven looks down on me and says, keep it up, son. We're going to preach to you today, but I want you to know, I don't, I don't ever want to lose an opportunity when the word starts to come forth and when the spirit of God starts to move. If you are here today 
and things are not right in your life, God is ready to move in your life today. You don't have to wait another day. You might have to wait a few more minutes, but you don't have to wait another day. God will move in your life, and he'll make everything that's wrong right yes. because that's what God does. He's a restorer of broken things. One of Lisa's good friends is a songwriter sent us a song, and I've got to put this into music someday. He sent us the lyrics to a song, and he says that God's the make, he's the fixer of broken things. I don't remember. No, that's my song. That's my song. But he, he think about, he was talking about how he takes things, be it bent, bent and rusted and broken, God restores it. We see people, some of you in this church might even be able to restore cars or restore things or build things that from nothing. God can take nothing and make something. So no matter if you hear today and you feel like you are nothing, not in the sight of God. Because when God comes into your life, that DNA comes into your life, and now you are no longer nothing. You are a child of the king. That's right. Hallelujah. So uh, that wasn't even in my notes. I don't know what I'm going to preach now. Okay, let's go ahead and do this song. Some lawyers can win And doctors can heal Your banker can lend At least they used to be able to Till your pockets are filled But if yours is a case Of a sin-stricken soul For the problems you face there's only one place to go. Just climb up that mountain where still springs the fountain by the sparkling crimson full Calvary's Lord. That same Jesus you heard of can take a black You can't play the cards Old man death's gonna deal For my Bible has planned Who the loser is gonna be See, there's only two in his hands And you know what? Well, they were nailed to that tree Forgiveness? Okay, here's the cow. Julie, just when, I, just when I put everything up thinking we weren't going to do these. <laughs> More Calvin. Ronnie says, two hands on the plow. Oh, okay. okay. Are you waiting on that? 
Oh, yeah. Okay. This is... I, I'm going to give you a little upbeat song while we're waiting for the upbeat song. More cowbell song. This is one that y'all have heard. Thank you, Miss Julie. And I've heard over the years. Thank you, Julie. I've heard over the years people do it. Well, I decided to take a song. You know, I, I've heard people sing. Some glad morning when this life is over. Well, I'm going to be long past you. Because with me, some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. You know, it's like, sing it like you mean it. You got to flap those wings so, a little faster, folks. So there was an old song. When I put this album together, there's an old song that I really love called Unclouded Day. But I had heard people sing it so much, I don't believe you. I don't believe you believe there's an unclouded day because I think that unclouded day is going to make me feel a little bit happier than it's making you feel. So I took this song and I did it my way and I even meshed a couple of the verses together because I just felt that it sounded better to me. So if you sing along with it, please feel free. You might get to that second verse and go, he's singing those things different. No, that's just the way I did it. I, I did it on purpose because I felt that if I would have written it, that's the way I would have written it. So here we go. We're going to sing uh, Unclouded Day. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the sky. They tell me of a home far away. They tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day.
sorry. Are you streaming this? Are you streaming this? Hi, everybody. Forgiveness is a powerful. fly, right? Huh, that's good. Oh! Yeah, do it. I, I got to take, and I, I don't want to take away from the word, but this is a word, right? I mean, it's still, we, we know that we're speaking, hopefully, songs do mean something, and they speak to hearts that words don't always do. Um, for those of you who weren't here, this is a song that after uh, some very trying times in my life, I've been married for 26 years and my wife came in one day and said, I don't want to be married anymore. And I told my kids that I didn't want to be a mother. Well, how do you not do that? But in any case, um, I was at a men's retreat. I'll tell the bridge, the Reader's Digest version is a men's retreat. And I was crying out to God because my life was shattered. I thought it was over, a minister and now I'm going through a divorce that I didn't want. And, um, and I sat there on the steps in a chapel one morning at 5.30. I had my guitar. And I cried out to God and said, what have you done for me lately? You know, if it's like if you shook your fist at God and said, what have you done? I, and, and this is important because I sat there and I tried to give God a list of things I had done for him. Yeah. Like he didn't know and like it even mattered. Right? What, what have you done for me? Because here's what I've done. I've preached and I've done this and I've done that. And then that's when I said, what have you done for me? And God gave me this song after he kind of smacked me upside the head. And this is just the way the song came out. It's called, That's What I Do. Hmm. 
there while sifting through the ashes of a life known for defeat. Jesus found a burning ember and gently laid it at his feet. And he said, Child, you know I love you. And I'll make you over new because that's what I do. I said, Lord, I just don't understand. so true and he said long before time began I already love you before you took your first breath you were someone that
There are some of you here today that may not know what Christ did for you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it this morning. <sighs> Heavenly Father, I just ask right now, God, that you will enter in deeper into this service, God, because you're already here. God, I ask you to let that mighty wind blow. God, let your spirit and your anointing get so thick in this place, God, that every life will be changed. Let no one leave this congregation today in this building the way they came. God, let those that have needs in their life, whether it's emotional or physical or financial, but God, the most important need I ask that you meet today, their spiritual need. God, because they need to know you. Father, help me to bring forth the word that you've placed in my heart so that those that are hearing here and may hear wherever this goes out, God, they will know that you are the only answer to every problem. And Father, we give you the glory and the honor and the praise. And everybody say it, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll tell you, this has been such a privilege. We were, when we were in California before the pandemic, we were going often and singing and ministering and getting to be with some of the best people in the world, you know, God's people. And this has been tough. And I know it's been tough on many churches and many pastors and certainly many congregations. And I fear sometimes that the congregations that have left, some of them might have gone to other churches and some just may stay gone. But if you're hearing this today, I want you to know there is a God that still loves you and it doesn't matter what the current circumstances are or who's in the White House or who's not in the White House. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He will direct your path. He will protect you. He will watch over you. He will give you guidance. He will give you providence. He will give you blessing. Um, brother talked this morning, and I did talk about the first fruits. I'm telling you, church, if you are not giving, give. Because when you give of your first fruits to the church that you attend, God will bless you. He has no alternative but to bless you because he has a promise. And he has made his word too. Now, I hear that there's only two ways to give. You give it because you want to. And if you don't give it, you're actually stealing from God. And I don't think anybody wants to steal from God. So I, I, I admonish you to, to give to your church. I pray that God will bless you in all that you do, because again, his word declares that he will. Um, and I thank you, Pastor, for those kind words. I do hope that God will speak to you. Now, I think you also read the scripture, but the Bible says, let every man purpose in his heart. So I don't wanna stand up here today, and I don't wanna coax you to give in the offering for us that will help us get to the next place. We normally talk a lot about recovery. My wife is uh, got 32, clean, 32 years clean and sober. She talked. She was facing prison time. She had uh, a $1,000 a day cocaine addiction, along with alcohol and all that. Um, God put odd couples together, right? Because I've never tasted alcohol or done drugs. Um, I, I jokingly said to her one time, I tried, snorting cork, uh, tried snorting coke once and almost drowned. I, I just, I, I don't know anything about drugs, and I'm thankful for that, and, and God put two of us together because she can go, she has a heart for those people who have addictions and who are suffering with it, and, um, you know, I'll just call myself out on it. I didn't understand it. I don't, I've grown to understand it over the years that I've been with her, but because it was never a problem for me, I just didn't understand why you didn't just quit. Just walk away. Just quit, but she knows that it calls your name, and she knows um, what those effects are. 
I knew one that called my name at a very young age. At five years old, I said this last night, and it's true. At five years old, I ran down to an altar when an old Pentecostal preacher was preaching because I didn't want to miss heaven. Now, people can say, you know, and this is not even the sermon, so I'm going to try to get into that, but I want to spend a few minutes just talking to you this morning. People will say, well, those old things, they were so doctrine. I never even heard about legalistic until the last few years. The Bible is legalistic. It tells us what we should and shouldn't do. There are laws, and there are things that we're supposed to follow. Do we want to have an unlegalistic society? That's what's happening in our world today. We want to tear down the laws, and we don't want to have any authority. There is an authority. There are city, county, state authorities. There's federal authorities. There's even, in some cases, world authorities, like the UN, that I, whatever. But God is the supreme authority, and we have to fall under some authority. A child left unchecked will just run out in the road or burn themselves on a fireplace. or a st- They don't know. We have to teach people. So what does the Bible tell us? That we're supposed to hide his word in our heart so that we don't sin against him. How many people really go into daily devotionals anymore? And, you know, and then there's those people that write books that really aren't devotionals at all. They just want to sell books. You know, I mean, it's about their mindset and their thinking. If you want to know, I'm not against reading other books, but if you want to know what your path for life should be, Read this book. This is the one that was ordained. I believe every word, every comma, every period. I mean, Lindsay asked me this morning, which one do I, which version do I choose? I didn't tell her this, but I choose the only one that I really believe in. Now, I'm not saying that I won't go to the NIV or some other translations to just see what y'all really think it's supposed to mean. You know, what, what somebody has translated. I like the King James, even though it's... Thus and thou and we and shouldest and shouldn't and wilt and all those things that most of us don't even understand. But I'm thankful that I believe that it has stood the test of time and God saved me when I was reading that Bible and God has kept me when I'm reading this Bible. So I guess it doesn't really matter what version you read, read the Bible so that you can follow the word of God. Um, last night I talked a little bit about two gardens and This is the first time in my life, really, that God had given me a series, if you will, of sermons, and I don't know where this will go. Um, But today I want to talk to you a little bit about your gardens, and we're still going to talk about the Garden of Eden, and we're going to go through this. If I had to title this, it would be Weeds versus Plants in the Garden of Your Life. And in Genesis 1, 11, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. See, God created us to bear fruit also. So when he planted that garden, and in verse 28 of the same Genesis 1, it says, and God blessed them, And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. See, God had a plan for us to live in this paradise. He he didn't want to create mankind and then put them in a place where they would struggle. God did not create you to struggle. God did not create the environment for you to struggle in. He created a pace of peace where all you had, think about this. Adam and Eve, all they had to do was get up and go eat something off the trees or the whatever. Now, God would have had to work it a little bit different with me because I am not a plant eater. I am a carnivore. But he gave us, that's why he gave us that scripture, to subdue it and go have what you want. So my wife knows that I love Mexican food. I could eat carne asada, breakfast, lunch, dinner. She says, no. I say, praise God for people who created carne asada. But um, anyway, in the garden, God gave them the perfect place. They didn't have to toil. They didn't have to spin. They, think about it. Even the climate was so great, he didn't have to put clothes on them. It was perfect. There was no sin. There was no semblance of sin. There was nothing to disturb them. 
They were not hot or cold. They were not hungry. They were not thirsty. They had everything they needed right there in the Garden of Eden. But then, Satan came in, as you know, and, and beguiled Eve. And in Genesis 3, 17 through 19, it says this. To Adam, this is God. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife. Man, I want to take a little pause for a minute. You better listen to your wife. Because my wife told me that I had to say that. We had a little conversation about this this morning. She asked me about some of my notes. And she says, well, why didn't he cover her? Why did, that was her very words. Why didn't he cover her? And I said, well, he can't be with her every minute of the day. And God made us free will choice, right? He gave Adam and Eve free will. She was not a Stepford wife. She was created in God's image as well out of man. But God made that. And we talked about last night, he created men and women, not the other 110 genders that the world has created. Man and woman, that's the perfect union. And so he said, because you listened to your wife and ate, so Adam took a step, and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Now he went from pleasant, peacefulness, not having to do anything to just survive and live a wonderful life. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. And it will produce thorns. And I want you to remember, what will it produce? And thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since it was from where you were taken. For dust you are, and dust you will return. What will it produce? Okay. When we moved back to Tennessee, it was a blessing to us because we went from a subdivision home in Sacramento. Um, you know, subdivision home. It was not anything extravagant. A nice home, and God blessed us with it. But we were able to buy 8.61 acres in a little place called Springfield, Tennessee. Not even hardly anybody around us. We got cornfields and wheat fields for miles, and it's just so peaceful and my wife loves the little deer that come through there until they tore up her peach tree and she don't love them so much anymore. Um, she said, I wonder if we can feed them. And I go, do not feed them. They are just big rats with antlers. You know, they just, they tear things up. That's all they do. Good to eat, but she won't let me kill them either. So we just got to keep them away. But we went there and this land had been only a home that we were fortunate to also find a home that had only been about two and a half years old and a couple built it and then they didn't make it in marriage, and so they were selling it off. But in this land, only probably about an acre of it was actually cleared off and usable. That's where the house was. So we drove up this drive when we fell in love with it, and it was a great thing. But we have toiled, and we have just worked our tails off to get this thing where we can see some of what's there. We walked through there, and we were looking for a meadow. We saw overhead pictures of this place, and so we wanted to go find our meadow because we were so thrilled to be in the country and have a meadow. How, how does that sound? It sounds so pleasant to have a meadow. So we parked along the side of the roads before we actually owned it. The offer was in, and we knew they'd accepted it. And we were walking through these thistles and thorns that were taller than me. And we had to move them aside, and, and Lisa was holding on to me. She had her head down like this, and she was holding on to the back of my shirt, you know, so I would be her covering, and I would walk through, and I would get all pricked and messed up with all that stuff, but we got to a place where I took a step, and we heard this, I stopped, and she said, what was it? I said, I don't know. I took, and I was having to walk through this stuff like this, right, just spreading things out as I went, really trying to stomp it down, get it under my feet, we say, you know, the devil, you're under my feet, you're under my feet. Well, this weeds had to be under my feet. I could not go through them without moving them aside. I took another step in here. I looked back at her and she said, what is it? I said, I don't know, but it's as big as a sparrow. And what it was, we found out later, there were some bees that were in there. She goes, well, if, if they come after you, we'll just turn around and run backwards. And I looked back and where we had came from was already sprung back up. I said, we only got one place to go now, and that's ahead. But you know, the Bible tells me, too, that he that putteth his hands to the plow and looketh back is not fit for the kingdom. 
We had started on this journey, and we were going to get through this journey together. And that's what we've committed to in life, too. We will go through this journey together. But as we went through there, we realized there's a lot of uninvited things. You know, when you're having a garden, the Garden of Eden had nothing in it to cause a flaw. But yet it says that thorns and thistles were going to come up, and the ground will be cursed, and you'll have to work that ground. And we even saw some things after we cleared it off, and you see some things start to come back up. And you go, well, that's kind of pretty. I go, it's a weed. It might have a flower on it. But that's just like sin. Sometimes sin looks so pretty. It has a flower on it. But if you let it grow in your life, it starts to take over. There are things back there, they're called um, thorn trees, and it's a, a black locust tree. This had to be some form of thing that they put on the crown of thorns. These things grow thorns that are this long on it. And she, we have this riding lawnmower that you can go through there with that many acres. And so she was driving through there one day, and she goes, there's some thorn trees out there. Now, we knew about it. I had to go through and cut all the limbs up because these things will literally impale you. They will go through tires. They will go through anything. Why God made those, I'm sure none of those were in the Garden of Eden because they are a treacherous, treacherous tree. We also have vines that will grow up in our trees. And when we got there, you'd see so many trees that were choked out by the vines. The vines wrap around the trees so tightly that the tree loses its ability to live. Sin will do that in your life. If you let sin, I have to go through there now and with a regular maintenance, try to get out there and pull those vines off because they're easy enough to do when they're young. Do you know that when sin first starts coming in your life, if you just say no, if you just say no, it's easier to walk away. But once you've walked down that path and you've let it get a grip on you and you've let that addiction get a grip on you and you've let those things get a grip on you and you've let your wandering eye get a grip on you and you've let your wandering heart get a grip on you, pretty soon you become immune to the promptings of the spirit. And everybody says you have a conscience. That's the Holy Ghost trying to tell you not to do something. And when you walk away from that, pretty soon you start to deafen that voice. Does God, I wanted God to yell at me when I wrote that song. He didn't yell at me. He spoke in a still, small voice. You know what God wants? He wants an intimate conversation with you. He wants you to listen. We have a friend that just recorded an album back there. Lisa's a producer. Some of you knew that. And so we went in, and the song says, I want thunder, not just whispers. He's talking about God. I want thunder, not just whispers. Well, that's wonderful. God doesn't usually give us thunder. He wants us to be in communion with him and to be intimate with him and to listen for that still, small voice. I've gotten to the age now where, and playing music for all these years, I realize that um, if Lisa is talking to me, I almost have to be looking at her to understand what she's saying. If we're having a conversation, I can understand everything she's saying. But if I'm talking to someone else and she says, Ronnie... Ronnie, she might have to say, Ronnie, to get my attention. I don't mean to not hear her. I've been distracted with something else. My hearing's not as good as it used to be. We need to get our spiritual hearing to the point that we can hear, that we know when it's God speaking. He says, my sheep know my voice. So we just have to be where we can hear his voice, right? I don't think anyone in this congregation this morning wants to be astray, but we have to be able to hear the master's voice. You know, um, what weeds do you have in your everyday life? Is it busyness, laziness, complacency, competition, judgment, comparing, lack of prayer, lack of communicating with God, seeking him for guidance and direction, not just asking him for something when you need it? Do you know that God wants to have a relationship with you? He wants to spend time with you each and every day. Why did Paul say pray without ceasing? It wasn't so your prayers would always be heard. It's so God would get to know your voice. Now, of course, he knows your voice. He knew you when you were in your womb, your mother's womb. But still, he wants to hear your voice. How many of you have loved ones that don't live in the area and you get a phone call from them? How refreshing to hear their voice. Don't we say that? Oh, it's so good to hear your voice. I'll tell you, I've got a song that I recorded, hold to God's unchanging hand. And Lisa went back through and found with my sister, which is 81, an old tape where my dad, a VHS tape, 
where someone recorded the video of our family gathering. And my dad was talking to his children about knowing God. Sometimes I play that not to hear myself sing, just to hear his voice. We need to hear the voice of God. If we strive for that, if we long for that, we want to hear the voice that leads us. He was a great man of God. I never saw anything in him that I thought should be different. I'm blessed that way. I know some of you may not have had parents that were that way, but I was blessed. I had a mother and a father that showed me the way that I should live. Didn't just tell me. They were a do-as-I-do parent group, and I'm thankful for that. But, you know, we want to see lives change. We want to see decisions. And I'm talking about, I hope every Christian does this. This is not just for me as a minister or Lisa or the pastor. We want to see decisions made for Jesus, families put back together, healings, demons cast out. That scares some people. Y'all are Pentecostal. I've been raised in my whole life, and I have seen demons cast out. I know that it happens. And I believe that there are some demons in our church world today that need to be cast out. We've invited Satan into our houses of worship, and he runs it more than the God does. You know, he likes to be emulate everything that God does. He wants to be the mirror image, which is always reverse of what God is, right? That's what he wants to be. We need to kick Satan out. We need to remove those weeds from our church. We need to call sin, sin, and we need to get people saved again. We go to so many churches, and half the congregation aren't saved. I don't know that to be the truth, but you can tell it by their actions. What does it say? You will be known by your love. And I see people that come and go just like a swinging door. That somewhere they, I'm glad that they're in church more than they're sitting at home. I'm glad that they're in church more than they're on the lake or whatever they could be doing. But they are, it's not getting it done. Just attending church doesn't make you a Christian any more than me walking into a garage makes me a car. It just doesn't have the correlation. We have to be that, have that connection with our Savior. Beautiful gardens require nurturing, fertilizing, watering, pruning, and removal of weeds. And as I was preparing for this, I also thought about something. We put things that have already been consumed into the ground, right? Manure. We put those in there around our gardens to help things grow. They've already been processed. They've been consumed. How do you let your garden grow, your own personal garden? Let those things that were consuming you be buried in the blood of Jesus. Those things that were taking you over need to get put in the ground. Because everything that God did, Christ had to go into the ground to come forth. We need to realize that whatever we do, we need to bury that. Put it away from us. Forget about it. Don't pick it up again. What does the word tell us too? When the word of God comes, suddenly... Satan comes to try to take it from you. Some of you are going to hear what I'm saying today and you're going to absorb it into your life for about 30 seconds. Some of you hopefully are going to take it and dwell on it and find the things that you liked about it and keep those and find some things that you didn't agree with and you're going to push those aside and that's fine as long as they're scriptural, you do that. I'm not going to try to say anything this morning that you can't find in the word, but you at least process it, process it. But we are so sudden to just come to church and then go away like nothing ever happened. And we go to lunch and the day goes on. And next Sunday, we come back and do the same thing. In the Garden of Eden, God created for companionship, but it became the Garden of Sin. The Garden of Gethsemane was a garden of suffering. It's called the Olive Press. When Christ was there, he was pressed. He was pressed. You want to talk between a rock and a hard place? Think about this for the Son of God. He knew he was the only salvation that could come to the world. And if he chose to say, I don't want to do this, Father. That's not how he prayed, by the way. Go back and look at it. He said, if it will, if it can be, let this cup pass from me. But if not, he already knew that there was no other salvation for the world. God would have had to wipe us out and start over. But Christ said, but Father, if I, only, if I have to drink this cup, then I will gladly do it. He presented himself to the Father, as I told you last night, willingly. 
You know, and as I was thinking about this too, we've got some symbols in the Bible and God never does anything just once. If somebody comes up and tries to tell you something that God has not already been dealing dealing with you about, be very cautious of it because God will tell you sometimes what you already know. In the word of God, he doesn't do anything one time. God always has a type and a shadow and we see in the Old Testament that many, we've talked about the types and shadows of Abraham and Isaac and the sacrifice that was going to be made and how that was the sacrificial lamb that was Christ and, and all that. But what about this one? I hope you've never thought of it this way. And if you have, then you're ahead of me because I thought about it during this pre- preparation. When God closed Noah up in the ark and though Noah built it by the grace of God, God shut them in. Right? He put them and protected them into the ark before it started to rain or as it started to rain. When it was time for them to find peace on the other side, outside of the ark now and start over again, he sent out a raven and the raven didn't come back. Right, And he kept doing this and doing this. He sent out the dove. And when the dove finally came back, what did the dove bring with it? An olive branch. Right? What is the dove a symbol of? What ascended upon Christ when he came up from the baptism? So even back then, God was telling his children, I have prepared a king for you. The Holy Spirit will come to you. I have have protected you. So even back then, he was showing the symbols of God to come on earth. There will be an olive branch. There will be a dove that will come down from heaven. The dove ascended on Christ when John the Baptist baptized him. He was in an olive garden where he prayed. Some say he may have been crucified on an olive tree. That was certainly in that region there. I've heard cypress trees, I've heard whatever. But the tree of life that Adam and Eve could have eaten from, the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they did eat from that separated them from God, Christ had to become that tree to restore. It was a tree that separated man from God. He had to be hung on a tree to restore humanity to God. From the ground you came, from the ground you will return, to the ground you will return. So Christ went back to the starting tenets of how the world was built and how the garden was built. And he said, I must undo all this. And the only way to do it is to just reverse it. So we went back and hung upon a tree. He took on all of our sins in the garden of Golgotha, which is called the skull, a garden that was meant to be death, where they crucified those that had wronged the Roman guard, the Rome that had wronged um, Rome. What was meant to be a garden of death became a garden of victory. Now they placed a crown of Upon his head. Have you ever wondered why thorns? It wasn't just for punishment. Church, it wasn't just for punishment. Let me show you what God does. He was restoring mankind. Because the sin that created the thorns in the beginning. It was an emblem of what had to be placed upon Christ's head. Those thorns that were an emblem of what separated man. Was now placed upon the son of God. So that he can say, I'm restoring you. I'll take those thorns so that I can build my kingdom where we can be restored with the Father in paradise as it was in Eden where there is no need for any of this anymore. You know there's no thorns in heaven. There's no weeds in heaven. His blood spilled to the ground to silence the crying of Abel's blood that was spilled back in Genesis. Christ, God said, I heard your brother's blood crying to me from the ground. We read that last night. (laughs) Hallelujah. Christ took every sin and every symbol of sin upon himself so that he could destroy it. John 19 says, 1941 says, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new sepulcher wherein man was never laid. The garden tomb was near a place of sacrifice And Christ was planted in the tomb in a garden. And in that garden, 
on the third day when the stone was rolled away. Resurrection power. That same power that dwelled in Christ dwells in you. Will restore your life. Man was created in the garden. Sin overcame mankind in the garden. Jesus overcame sin in a garden. And God has prepared an eternal garden for us. No weeds, no thorns. Revelation 22 and 2 says, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life, which bare 12 manners of fruits, and yielded a fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations. I want you to know something. We will never find perfection in this world. Those young ladies or young men or old women or old men, to try to find it in a mirror or try to be perfect, you're not going to make it. My wife's pretty close. She's perfect in my eyes. But we have gotten so caught up into the world and those things where we try to measure ourselves by what we see that is not real. I see our youth being troubled by what they see, these images of these perfect little people that are all photoshopped and their lives are so messed up anyway. Why would you want to be like them when they aren't happy? They don't know. You see teen suicide and, and suicide going up through this pandemic as well. We forget that we must keep our eye on the one who sees us as perfect instead of trying to do that ourselves. Get that off of you and give that to Jesus. He sees you as perfect. We were born into sin Redeemed by Christ so we can walk in victory in heaven with Jesus for eternity. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. One day Christ is coming back, and I don't believe it's going to be long. But you know he's looking for a church without blemish. There were no blemishes. There were no spots. There were no wrinkles there weren't even wrinkles on Adam and Eve, for goodness sakes. They were perfect, spotless, without blemish. That's how God's creation was designed. You are perfect in God's eyes. When he sees you, if you have the blood of Christ applied to your life, all he sees is his son. His son was perfect. You become Christ to him. Do you get that concept? If you have enough of Jesus Christ, that you become Christ to the Father. I'm not saying that you take your place in Christ's place, but he said, I and the Father are one, and we are now sons and heirs and daughters with him. We are one of God's children. That should mean something to you. It's not a small thing to become a child of God. But we need to take on that godly character and not just say, well, I asked God to forgive me, so now I am a child of God. No, you're not. Not really. If you're a child of God, you will also obey his commandments. Now, my children don't obey me anymore. They're 31 and 20-something. They're old. They're still my child. So even though they don't obey me, when I say that, we're all children of God. There's no other one by who anyone was created but God. But I'm saying if you want to live victoriously in your life, make sure that blood is applied and you're adhering to his principles and God will bless you. I'm going to ask Lisa to come up and sing another song for you as we close this morning. I want you to be in an attitude of prayer. We're going to get you out of here so you can beat the Baptist to Applebee's. But I hope that God has given you something today that you can go back home and start to work on some weed removal. That you look at the things. And here's what we're going to do. As Lisa sings this song to you, for you, if there's anyone that needs prayer, and I would like everyone to bow their heads quickly. You know, we assume that because you come to church, you're, we're all looking for something and we want to be in the right mind with the right people. But if you need Jesus in your heart today, you came today and you said, Brother Ronnie, I, I'm not where I need to be. I need to get deeper. I need to get those weeds out of my life. I want to find that garden place that God wants to be in. We just lift up your hand. Let me pray for you. Thank you. Thank you for those hands. Hallelujah. I want you to know that Jesus loves you. 
I want you to say this prayer with me. And then as Lisa sings this song, if there's any one of you here today that needs prayer for healing or emotional healing or spiritual healing, anything that you need, the pastor's going to come to and the elders of the church, we're going to pray. We want to do what the scripture says to lay hands upon you and pray. I want everyone in the congregation so no one feels um, strange in any way. Please pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that Jesus Christ is your son, that he came to earth, died upon the cross, rose the third day, and ascended into heaven to be with you. I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart, to forgive me of my sins, to help me break my addictions, to change my course, and to set my path towards heaven. Lord, I give you my life. I ask you to be my Lord and come into my heart. If you prayed that prayer this morning and you mean it, Jesus Christ is faithful and just to forgive you. But you have to do something too. You have to take action. You can't just say the prayer and go back the way you wanted to be before. You have to seek him, seek him, seek him. Follow him and he will never, ever forsake you. Let God bless you as Lisa sings this song. And just any of those that you need prayer, please come to the front and we'll pray for you.
Jesus, this 